Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. Today we're going to review this handheld. This is the Aya Neo 2S. This is essentially an upgrade from the original Aya Neo 2, which came out late last year. Now, this is the luxury brand of Aya Neo products. It's a Windows based handheld PC, but it has the top of the line specs and components within their product line. Now, as a result of having top of the line features, this also has a luxury price tag. In fact, this is about twice the cost of a high-end Steam Deck or the ROG Ally when you fully kit it out. Now, for me as a reviewer, it's a little bit above my own price point if I was to personally buy a handheld PC, but I kind of like that perspective because it has a lot of things that it needs to do in order to justify that higher price. And so that's what we're gonna focus on here in this video. What things have been upgraded from the original Aya Neo 2, and does that justify having a higher price tag. And initially I thought this was just going to be a spec bump, so a higher grade CPU inside, but it turns out that they've changed about eight different components from the Aya Neo 2 to the 2S, and so that's what we'll cover here in this video. So if you are interested in getting a high-end handheld PC, and maybe the ROG Ally isn't quite floating your boat, then maybe this is the video for you. Either way, let's go ahead and do a deep dive review, and so without any further delay, let's go ahead and jump in. Okay, to start, let's talk about what exactly is the Aya Neo 2S in terms of features and specs. This is a Windows-based handheld with a 7-inch IPS LCD panel with a resolution of 1920 by 1200. And it comes with a variety of colors and specs, so starting with 16 gigs of RAM all the way up to 64. And your storage options start at 512 gigs but can go up to 4 terabytes. And here's the rest of the specs right here. I'm not going to read them off because you can see all these on their website, but I do want to make note of the fact that it has a 50 watt hour battery, so that's 25% bigger than the Steam Deck or the ROG Ally. And it also has two USB 4.0. So if you wanted to use it with an external GPU, this could definitely work. Now, things start to get confusing when we start talking about the Aya Neo Geek. This is the budget version of the Aya Neo 2S. And there are some differences here. For example, the 2S does not have bezels around its screen while the Geek does. Additionally, the Geek has a lower resolution display, so it is 1280 by 800, but it is that same 7 inch size. But the nice thing here is that it has the same power and performance, but at a lower price. And currently, both of these devices are part of the same Indiegogo campaign, which is live right now. And as you can see here, the most budget geek model, which comes with that 800p display with 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage, is going for $700 early bird right now. And really, at that price point, it's not bad. That's the same price as the ROG Ally. However, as you start working your way up, you will see the price increase quite a bit. So for example, if you wanted to double the RAM, it'll be $800, and it'll go up from there. So for example, for $850, you can upgrade the screen to 1200p resolution. And finally, we'll get to the Aya Neo 2S. As you can see, the cheapest model that's available right now has an early bird price of 950 bucks. And that also is going to net you 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gigs of storage. Now, the unit they sent me over to test is quite a bit heftier, so it has double the RAM at 32 gigs and 2 terabytes of storage. And as you can see, the price is relatively high already at 1150 but when it goes to retail, it's going to be 1550 That's pretty darn expensive. And that's not even the highest model. You can get one with 64 gigs of RAM and a whopping 4 terabytes of storage. I think that's a bit overkill, but all the same, if you want to spend $1,400 on a handheld PC, they are giving customers that option. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the unboxing experience, and this is going to be very similar to the Aya Neo 2. In fact, there's no real difference here at all. And so inside, you'll find a quick start manual, and then also these little tabs right here that go on each side of the device. And this is in case you need to get inside the device, because the screws are hidden behind these tabs, so there are replacements right here. Anyway, further inside the box, you can see we have a bunch of different adapters here at the very bottom. To start, we have some USB-C adapters, and then a bunch of different power plugs. Now, I'm not super familiar with all these international plugs right here, but I am fairly certain this one here is for Antarctica. Also included is a USB-C cable, as well as the power adapter. This is rated for 65 watts altogether. And so now let's take a quick look at the front of the device itself, and I'm seeing no major change here between the Aya Neo 2 and the 2S. One of my favorite things about this model is that it has a single plate of glass across the entire front, and so because of that, there is no bezel on the screen. It is very impressive and cool to the touch. So before we start diving in and picking apart the hardware itself, let's go ahead and discuss some of the differences between the original Aya Neo 2 and the new Aya Neo 2S. And like I mentioned in the intro, there are eight different things that they have changed. Let's walk through those real quick. Number one is going to be the CPU. This has been changed to the Ryzen 7 7840U. And at the time I'm making this video, this is the most powerful APU that's available on the market today. 
As a quick example, here are the Time Spy scores between the INEO 2S on the top and the INEO 2. And so as you can see in one generational leap between the 6800U and the 7840U, we're looking at a pretty big jump in performance between the two. And also bear in mind, I did the testing here at 15 watt TDP. So this is not the max that it could do, but really just a typical use case. As I'll show you later in the video, I find that 15 watts seems to be the sweet spot when it comes to a power profile. Now the next three upgrades are interconnected, and so we'll knock all three of these out at once. To start, there's a new design for their copper heat tubes, as you can see right here. In in addition, they've added a graphene patch, which is supposed to help with the heat dissipation overall. Now, Ioneo is actually offering an upgrade kit available for free on their website for anybody who already owns the original Ioneo 2 or the Ioneo Geek. And they're also offering a speaker upgrade, which is pretty cool. Anyway, they did send me over this heat dissipation upgrade kit, but I never got around to actually using it on my Ioneo 2. Either way, this is a great excuse to take a look inside, and then we have all the components that we would need to make this upgrade. In addition to that back patch that we already mentioned, you also have some screwdrivers and screws to help you along the way. I also found it kind of interesting that they have upgraded triggers. We'll talk about these in a minute, but they actually included that with this kit. And for me personally, I think that this right here is probably worth getting it alone. And finally, the third part of their new cooling system is that they have a new airflow design here on the top. And honestly, as far as I can tell, this just means that they have bigger holes for the exhaust vent. Now, I did some stress testing between the Ioneo 2S on top and the Ioneo 2 here on the bottom. Both of these are running Time Spy Extreme at a 22 watt TDP. And as you can see right here, in addition to getting better performance on the 2S, it's actually running about 5 degrees cooler overall. So it doesn't look to be a huge jump when it comes to the additional cooling properties, but every little bit helps with a handheld. And so I do appreciate the fact that they have made this upgrade. And it also looks like they made some adjustments to that little patch that comes with the device. Previously, you had to replace it with a new one, but it looks like with the 2S, you should be able to take it off and put it back on. Next up, Ioneo claims that they've improved the body mold of the 2S. And I'm not really sure what that means because when I look at the two, the design itself seems to be exactly the same. However, I could tell that the feel of the plastic on the 2S is a little bit more powdery and less slick than it was before. Now, after about a week of testing, it did get a little bit more slick than my first few minutes with the device, but all the same, it still feels a lot better than my Ioneo 2. And so I think they have improved the plastics on the outer shell here overall. And for me, that's a great thing because that's one of my main complaints about the Ioneo devices is that the feel of the plastic always felt a little bit cheap. However, I think that if I was not holding each of these devices at the same time, I probably wouldn't tell a difference between the two. So the improvement here is very subtle. Next up, we have an upgraded trigger experience. And I wasn't really sure what this meant just because their marketing materials are pretty darn vague. But when comparing the two together, in addition to seeing that the color is a little bit different, it's darker on the new 2S, I did find that the travel distance from pressing the trigger from 0 to 100 does seem to be just a little bit lower. And overall, I think this is a great move because I have mentioned before in my other videos that I think the INEO 2 triggers feel more like paddles, like they're just a little bit too big. And so again, the difference here is subtle, but I did find that in my week of testing, I greatly preferred the smaller triggers that are on the 2S compared to the INEO 2. If I was king for a day, I think I would still make the travel distance just a little bit smaller, but this is still a great step in the right direction. Okay, and finally, they say there is some sort of improvement to the fingerprint unlocking mechanism. It says anti-accidental touch. I'm not really sure what that means, but all the same, I didn't really tell the difference between the two. For me personally, I've never really found that the fingerprint mechanism on these devices is very effective. Anyway, those are all the big changes, so let's actually go through each of the components next. We'll start with the controls. Now, this isn't going to be a deep dive into each of these aspects, but I do want to touch upon each of the things that I like the most. Number one, these analog sticks are big and chunky. They have a nice smooth gliding feel to them and they use hall sensors. This means that over time, these sticks will not develop stick drift and they also don't have any dead zones. And so they are very good to use. The D-pad has a rubber membrane connection, which means it has a classic retro feel to it. It feels pretty good, but it is a little bit mushy. But I would still say this is a pretty good D-pad overall. Likewise, the face buttons have a rubber membrane contact as well, and so they have that kind of classic mushy feel to them. But they are nice and responsive, although I wish they were just a tiny bit bigger. Now on the bottom right here, we have two INEO buttons. So the far right one will show the desktop, and the other one will bring up the quick menu. But yes, overall, that's a quick look at all of the individual buttons that we have here on the front. 
Okay, up top, in addition to the shoulders and triggers, we have these two hotkey buttons here on the far sides. And then we have the power button, which is coupled with the fingerprint sensor that I mentioned before. Next, we have the volume up and down buttons, a microphone input, and then two of our USB-C ports here on the top. And then of course on the right we have our heat exhaust vent. Now we've already talked about the triggers, but the bumpers here are actually pretty good too. They have a soft click to them and are very easy to press down on, so no complaints here. On the bottom we have two stereo speakers, as well as a headphone jack, SD card slot, and then finally another USB-C port. And it also looks like there's a microphone input here on the bottom too. Now in addition to the controls, I always like to talk about ergonomics, so let's discuss this with the iNeo 2S. Number one, the device itself has a very rounded feel to it, and so it just kind of cups naturally into your hands. As far as grips on the back, there is a little bit of a bump here so that you can kind of move your fingers around it, but overall I've always found that it's not quite enough of a grip to really kind of hold on to. Instead, a lot of your grip is going to actually come from the front of the device, and it's going to be with your index fingers as well as your thumbs. Basically, because this device is so rounded, your hands are just going to kind of cup it into place. And it is a pretty natural feeling, and I like the fact that the outer sides really kind to dig into your palms in a really comfortable way. And so when you first pick up the iNeo 2S, it is an immediately comfortable experience and it's kind of impressive. Like you pick it up and you're like, wow, this is a high quality device that has been designed well. However, I have found that over prolonged use, the grip becomes a little bit less than ideal. And a lot of that comes with the overall flatness of the back right here. Like I mentioned, yes, it is kind of a grip, but all the same, it's not like something that you can actively hold onto with your hands. And in the end, it feels less like holding onto a real controller with grips and more like holding onto a very thick and grippy sandwich. Now the Asus ROG Ally is a very similar experience. It is kind of flat overall, but I have found that the angle of the grips right here actually are a little bit more natural feeling in the hand. And so while this one is also a flat device, I have found that this one doesn't bother me as much over prolonged use. For another example, here's the Steam Deck, and this one has a much chunkier grip to it. And as a result, my back fingers feel like they can grip on the entire thing, and it's just a much more comfortable experience. And honestly, this is kind of hard to convey over video, but all the same, here's another angle so you can get an idea. And I think among all the other handheld PCs, the Steam Deck for me is the most comfortable. It has these wide angle grips that just make it a little bit more rounded of an experience. As a direct comparison here, you can see that the ROG Ally is definitely flatter. My fingers are not really cupping or curling around the grips. But I think a lot of that is mitigated by the fact that the outer sides on the front are just more sunken in. And I think these two elements combined do make a flatter experience, but it is still very comfortable. This is something I can play for hours on end. Meanwhile, the iNeo 2S design is just kind of weird. Like it has these very chunky grips, but they're so flat instead of rounded that I can't really grip onto them. In addition, the roundedness of the front right here just doesn't seem to mesh very well with how I want to grab it either. And so while, like I mentioned, it is immediately impressive and pretty comfortable when you first pick it up, this is not a device that I end up playing over long-term use. Honestly, after about an hour of play, that's usually when I want to quit, just because it just feels like I need to give my hands a break. Now that's not to say this is an uncomfortable device, it just so happens that there are other devices that are more comfortable. Now in addition to the overall form and feel, there's another thing to consider, which is the design of the controls too. And the design on the iNeo 2S is just a little bit weird when it comes to actual ergonomics. By this I mean that the analog sticks and the other controls are parallel to one another. And I found this makes it a little bit awkward. For example, when pressing on the face buttons, your thumb will press up against the right analog stick. In addition, reaching down to the D-pad with your left thumb just feels a little bit unnatural as well. Now, iNeo actually addressed this a little bit with their iNeo Geek line, which came out after the iNeo 2. And as you can see right here, the D-pad and the right analog stick are actually inset closer to the screen than the other two up top. This provides a little bit of a V-shape, which is actually ideal when it comes to handhelds like this. Now, honestly, I think that the difference here is very subtle. In fact, it took me like three days to even notice it when I first got the iNeo Geek. So I think between the two, it's not going to be a monumental change. In fact, it's something that you may not notice right out of the gate. All the same, this is one of those things that I kind of can't unsee now that I've seen it. And so yes, the iNeo Geek, I think is better in that regard. However, I think there are other devices that are designed a little bit better than these two. For example, the ROG Ally has a very distinct V-shape as you can see right here. And I think this does contribute to it being a more comfortable handheld to use. Another similar handheld PC that also has a prominent V-shape is going to be the AOK Zoe A. One Pro. And so in wrapping up this section here, I want to reiterate the fact that this is still a very comfortable handheld. And there are some elements to the iNeo 2S that I really enjoy. For example, that glass panel across the entire front just feels really nice and smooth. 
And I also appreciate that this device here is not just a spec bump. So for example, the improvement with the triggers is very tangible for me. And I also like the fact that they're improving the feel of the plastics for their devices as well. So overall, yes, this is a well-designed device that is not quite perfect. Okay, next up, let's do some quick comparisons against other devices, because if you are shopping around for an INDO 2S, you might be thinking about one of the others too. As a palette cleanser, here is the Nintendo Switch OLED. And the reason I'm showing this off is because the Switch is a bit of a universal size, so you probably know how big this one is, and so you can compare it against the INEO 2S. For another comparison, here is the Asus ROG Ally. As you can see, this one's just a little bit larger than the INEO 2S. Up next, we have the Steam Deck. This one actually has the exact same screen size, but a lower resolution than the 2S. And as you can see, the Steam Deck is quite a bit bigger, and that probably has to do with the trackpads and just that larger grip. And finally, here's that AOK Zoe A1 Pro again. This one actually has the exact same chip as the iNeo 2S, and the display actually has the same resolution and aspect ratio. However, it is one inch larger on the AOK Zoe. In terms of weight, you can see the iNeo 2S is 669 grams overall. This makes it quite a bit heavier than the Nintendo Switch OLED, and then also about 10% heavier than the ROG Ally. When compared to the Steam Deck, it is a very similar size, but it is lighter than the AOK Zoe A1 Pro, which comes in at 730 grams. Next up, we're going to talk about the screen and the sound experience with the iNeo 2S. First thing I want to mention is it appears that this screen is using PWM, or Pulse Width Modulation. Now I noticed with my 60 frames per second camera that I was picking up on a little bit of screen flickering, and that's because of that PWM. Now to the naked eye, you won't see that flickering, but for the footage that you'll see through the rest of the video, you will. And there is a small percentage of the population that actually can detect this and get headaches from it. And so if you are susceptible to the flickering that comes from PWM, you may want to steer clear of this display. Now chances are you probably won't notice it at all. For example, the Nintendo Switch OLED also uses PWM. But all the same, I did want to make note of it just for the rest of our footage. And of note, the original iNeo 2, which is here on the bottom, does not have that same flickering. Now in terms of just color richness and saturation, this is a really good panel in that regard. And it looks to be exactly the same as it was on the original iNeo 2, which I thought was one of the best displays I'd ever used. In fact, my only negative to this screen is the fact that neither of these will get very dim. If I turn off the studio lights, you can see that it is still fairly bright right here. And to give you a better idea of how this is going to look overall, let's do some comparisons. We're going to start with the ROG Ally. As you can see right here, the ROG Ally is just a little bit less saturated overall. But if we go down to minimum brightness, you can see that the Ally is quite a bit more dim than the other. And so between the two, if I had to play one in the dark, I would prefer to play with the Ally. Now comparing with the Steam Deck, the iNeo 2S just has a little bit better color balance. In fact, the reds on the Steam Deck look a little bit orange. However, if we do that dimness trick again, you can see that the Steam Deck is actually even more dim than any of the others. And of course, this will be most important to you if you do plan on playing like, for example, in bed. But all the same, I do like to test this with every device. Overall, I think this is a great display that can get pretty impressively bright and works well in a lot of different situations. And so really, when it comes down to it, the most important factors are going to be something like color balance and saturation, and this one knocks it out of the park. Okay, next up, let's do a quick sound test using Hades at full volume. And this is a very similar experience to the other iNeo handhelds. The volume always seems to be a little bit muted, and the sound itself seems to be muffled. And so unfortunately for this one, I would say that the audio here is not very premium. It's basically average at best. And finally, we're going to take a listen to the fan noise. So I'm going to run this at a 32 watt TDP, really pushing it to the max here with God of War. Overall, I would say this is pretty loud, but no louder than many other handheld PCs, including the Steam Deck. Okay, next up, we're going to talk about the software experience, mostly focusing on the Aya Space app, which comes with a device. And this app will function both as a front end, but then also let you make some settings tweaks too. For example, within here, you can adjust the power profiles. By default, they have 22, 15, and 11 watt profiles. But then also they have what they call a pro mode, anywhere from 33 watts down to 3 watts if you'd like to use it. And this is very similar to how it was on the iNeo 2 as well. 
And additionally, you can do things like adjusting the resolution and the fan speed here on the front page. Now there's also another tab here in the middle, which will pull up all the games that you have installed. So this is a way to access your Steam games and your Xbox games, all of those all in one place. Now, if you press that far right button on the bottom, it'll bring up the desktop and then the one next to it will bring up a quick menu. And within here, you have some of those similar options that we saw on that front page. So this is where I go to adjust things like the power profile, as well as the volume and brightness. Now, additionally, within the IS Space app, there are a couple other features. So for example, you can adjust the quick menu functions here on the right. And then also within here, you have some adjustments and tweaks that you can do to the handheld to really dial in your preferences. For example, within here, you can fine tune the joystick and trigger sensitivity, but then also you can adjust the vibration strength and even turn on the gyroscopic controls. In another menu, you can adjust the RGB lighting. So for example, I'm using this one here called Ripple, which kind of cycles through the colors. Additionally, you can set up hotkeys for your shoulder keys. And there's quite a few options right here. And so if you do want to use these for a specific purpose, you might be able to map them here. However, most of the time, I don't really use the iSpace app. I've always found it to be a little bit buggy. And so typically what I will do is just use the Steam big picture mode here to navigate through my games. And then when I do need to adjust things like the power profile or brightness, I can bring up the iSpace quick menu right here, and it'll just work as an overlay over my entire experience. Okay, I hope those last sections gave you an idea of the overall feel of using the iNeo 2S. Now let's actually get into game performance. Our first section will be PC games, and we'll start with lighter weight games and work our way up. Now, the power profiles will go all the way down to a 3 watt TDP, but I found that very few games will actually run at full speed at that low profile. And even then, the entire system kind of bogs down a bunch. I've actually found that 5 watts seems to be the sweet spot when it comes to low end TDP gaming. And for the most part, that's what I ended up using with these lightweight games. And so a 5 watt TDP will play most of your indie games, you know, platformers, things like that. And I found that at a 5 watt TDP, I got a little bit better performance than I was expecting. For example, Cuphead is a game that usually requires something like an 8 watt TDP, but here on this chipset, 5 works great. Similarly, I was able to get Hollow Knight to work at full speed at a 6 watt TDP. Now moving our way up at an 8 watt TDP, you can play quite a few more games. For example, Horizon Chase Turbo and even Hades will actually work well at an 8 watt TDP. This is a game that often has to play at a 10 or 12 watts. And so because of that, it really showcases the efficiency of the 7840U chip that we have inside. Along those same lines, I found that at 11 watts, we can get some pretty great game performance with lower end games. This is going to include some lightweight PC games as well as what I consider to be Xbox 360 era games too. So games like Tomb Raider or the 2008 version of Prince of Persia actually run at full speed at a 1200p resolution. Now, as we start moving our way up, we are going to have a lot more choices when it comes to performance as well as power profile. For example, with Grand Theft Auto 5 at 1200p under the normal or low settings at 11 watt TDP, we're going to get an average of about 50 frames per second. So not quite 60, but still pretty good. However, if we bump that up to a 15 watt TDP, we'll get something well above 60 frames right here. So it's really going to come down to that balance between your frame rate and graphical fidelity, as well as how much power and battery life you're willing to spend. Let me give you a few more examples. We're going to start here with Horizon Zero Dawn. This one at a 1200p resolution on low settings can run pretty well at a 15 watt TDP. In fact, you could probably set this to a locked 30 frames per second and have a great time. However, if you want to try to push it more, you can definitely do that. So if we bump this up to a 22 watt TDP, you can see here we're getting an average frame rate of about 40, maybe 42 frames per second. Personally, I think that's a pretty big bump in power profile just to get you a few more frames per second. But if you wanted to lock it at 40 frames, you could probably do that here at 22 watts. And as you'll see in some other examples, you'll get diminishing returns if you go anything beyond 22 watts. For example, if we max this out to a 33 watt TDP, we're only going to get an average of about 45 frames altogether. And I don't think that bumping it up an additional 11 watts is really going to be worth getting those extra 2 to 3 frames. However, if you plan on playing this device docked, for example here with the Ioneo multi-docking station, you can actually push this to that higher TDP because you won't have to worry about battery life. And so this might be a great example if you plan on playing this at a desk or maybe hooked up to a TV, you can actually really push this profile to get some pretty good gaming. However, I found that when in handheld mode, my favorite power profile is a 15 watt TDP. This will allow me to play most games, including some AAA games, at a pretty good frame rate. For example, I could lock this at 30 frames per second with Marvel's Spider-Man, and the same thing with God of War. And I think that a 1200p resolution at low settings like this looks phenomenal on this device. 
And you may find that there are some games that you can actually bump up even more. So for example, Final Fantasy VII Remake at a 1080p high settings can get me well above 30 frames. And if I'm willing to bump it up to a 22 watt TDP, I can actually get pretty close to 60, and that's going to feel a lot smoother than those 30. Another example here would be The Witcher 3. At a 15 watt TDP, I can get an average of about 40 frames per second, which is pretty impressive considering how hard this game is to actually run. However, it will be diminishing returns when we start upping the power profile. At 22 watts, we're going to get maybe about 45, 47 frames per second. And surprisingly, even if I push it all the way up to a 33 watt TDP, it doesn't really show any improvement in the overall frame rate. So for me, this is definitely a game that I would tend to prefer to play at a 15 watt TDP. Let me give you a couple more examples. We're going to start with Elden Ring. This one at 1200p low settings at a 15 watt TDP will give you an average of about 30 frames per second. Again, like those other games, I think this is a very good way to play it. And like with the others, it's going to be diminishing returns when you have a higher power profile. Here at 33 watt TDP, we're only getting an average of maybe about 40, 45 frames per second altogether. So for me, I would say this juice is definitely not worth the squeeze. However, there may be some games that you will want to have a higher frame rate. For example, Destiny 2 is one that I always prefer to play at 60 frames per second. However, at a 15 watt TDP at 1200p resolution, we're only going to get about 40, 45 frames altogether. And so this is a game I do prefer to play at a 22 watt TDP overall. This will give me about 55, 58 frames per second, and that's pretty good for me. Okay, so that's PC game testing. Now let's move over to my bread and butter, which is emulation. Of course, all the lightweight systems are going to play just fine, so we're going to start at PS2 and GameCube and work our way up from there. We're going to start with PS2 and other Sony systems. Now to start, this chip is more than capable of playing PS2, and so what I want to find here is something that's at very good resolution, but also not going to drain the battery too much. And I found that at a 3x resolution, which is basically 1080p, you can play all these games at about 8 watt TDP. And to me, this is pretty incredible that we can play these type of games at this high of a resolution at this low of a power profile. In terms of battery life, I would expect to be able to get about three and a half hours of PS2 gameplay at 8 watts. So yes, PS2 is going to be great on this machine. Let's move on to PlayStation 3. For this system, I started out at a 15 watt TDP, and most of the lightweight games or even middleweight games are going to play great at this wattage. So things like fighting games and even racing games will play at 15 watts no problem. I even found that some 3D based games like Heavenly Sword and even some 3D based 2D games like Little Big Planet 2 still play great at 15 watts. Now as we start getting into the games with 3D engines, something like Prince of Persia, you will have to bump up that TDP to 22 watts. Just bear in mind that I also played the PC port earlier in this video at 11 watt TDP and 60 frames per second. So if I had a choice between the two, I would much rather play the other one, but I wanted to show this off for demonstration purposes. Another game I like to demo is Ratchet and Clank Quest for Booty. This one's pretty darn hard to play. But as you can see here, we're hovering around 50, almost 60 frames per second in some parts at 22 watts. And finally, one of the hardest games I have to emulate in my PS3 catalog is Infamous. This is a game that just simply will not run on a lot of their chipsets, but as you can see here at a 22 watt TDP, we are getting well above 30 frames per second, and so this is going to be a great gameplay experience here on this INEO 2S. Okay, that's it for Sony systems, let's move on to Nintendo, starting with GameCube. And the performance here is going to be exactly how it was on the PlayStation 2. So we're going to do a 3x resolution, which is essentially 1080p, but at an 8 watt TDP. And as you can see here, GameCube can play no problem at this power profile. Again, you're going to get about three and a half hours of gameplay overall. Another nice thing about the 16 by 10 aspect ratio on this screen is that 4 by 3 content like Nintendo GameCube is going to fill up a lot of that screen, and so you won't have a lot of screen real estate that's being wasted. Moving on, we're going to try Nintendo 3DS. Now this one is using a 3x resolution with the Canary version of the Citra emulator. And I did find that there were some hiccups here and there, like I wasn't getting a 100% smooth frame rate when I was playing. And I found this didn't have to do with the TDP. I could play everything at 8 watts, 11, 15, it was all going to be the same. So for me, this just comes down to the fact that this is a very new chipset, and so I think optimization still needs to occur on this emulator. Either way, 3x resolution is no problem for an 8 watt TDP profile, and so once those bugs get fixed and we have a little bit less stuttering, I think this will be a great experience for playing 3DS. Next up, we're going to do Nintendo Wii U using the CMU emulator at a native resolution. As you can see right here at 11 watt TDP, we can play most of these games pretty darn well. And as I'll show you my battery testing section, which is coming up next, you'll find that we'll get about 2 hours and 45 minutes of gameplay at an 11 watt TDP. 
So all things considered, I would say this is a very capable device when it comes to playing Wii U games. Now testing out Breath of the Wild is a different beast just because this one's much harder to emulate, but a 15 watt TDP gives me an average of about 40 frames per second and I think that's totally playable. If you do want to boost it up to a 22 watt TDP, you will get closer to 60 frames if that is something you'd rather have. Finally, our last Nintendo section is going to be Nintendo Switch, starting out with Super Mario 3D World at a 15 watt TDP. And I was surprised to find that most games played at a 15 watt power profile pretty well, even in docked mode. So if you do want to emulate Nintendo Switch games, I think this is going to be a great device for that as well. You are going to get some stutters here and there in the very beginning of most of these games as the shaders first cache, but the longer you play it, the better it'll get. Moving on from there, let's try out Microsoft, so starting with the original Xbox. In this one I found that I have to push a lot of power into this emulator and even then the results aren't great. So for example, I'm playing these games at a native resolution and even at a 22 watt TDP, I'm having a lot of stutters and other issues. For example, I saw frequent dips with Soul Calibur 2 going below 60 frames per second within the video debug window. And it's a similar story with NBA Live 06. I found quite a few dips here. The overall experience isn't terrible. And so for many Xbox games, you can still play them. But all the same, it's not going to be as great as you might hope, especially compared with other systems from the same generation like GameCube and PS2. And sadly, there will be some Xbox games that just won't run well at all. For example, Project Gotham Racing just kind of crawls. Now, paradoxically, the Xbox 360 performs quite a bit better at a 22 watt TDP. So I found that many Xbox 360 games are very playable here within the latest Xenia emulator. When it comes to this emulator, it's all about compatibility. And so not every game is going to play well, but those that are compatible with this emulator are at least going to play on this handheld. In the end, I would say yes, this is a device capable of Xbox 360 as far at least as the emulator can take us. Okay, now it's time to talk about battery life. We're going to start by saying that it takes about an hour and 40 minutes to charge the device from 0 to 100. And I found that sleep mode here works pretty well. I lost about 5% battery overnight. Now starting the right here is going to be our best case scenario. This is at a 5 watt TDP and I'm playing a lightweight Metroidvania game called Blasphemous. I've also turned off the LEDs and enabled the airplane mode so there's no Wi-Fi or Bluetooth happening right now. You can kind of think of this as like how it would be if you were playing on an airplane. Either way, as you can see at 5 watts, we're getting just under 5 hours of battery life. And that's pretty impressive considering the iNeo 2 had the same size battery but only got about four and a half. Up next we have the 11 watt TDP profile and like I mentioned earlier, it gives you about two hours and 45 minutes altogether. And then finally we have what I would like to call the sweet spot. That's that 15 watt TDP. At this power profile, you're gonna be able to play most PC games, but then also emulate things like PlayStation 3 and Nintendo Switch. And as you can see, it gives you about two hours and 15 minutes of battery life altogether. And that's perfect for me because that's like my ideal game session right there. Now, if you keep pushing from there, it is going to tax the battery. For example, here with Destiny 2 at 22 watts, I got about an hour and 20 minutes altogether. So this is gonna be better for some very brief but impressive gaming sessions. And then finally, in our worst case scenario, I pushed it all the way to 33 watts and this gave me about 55 minutes altogether. However, I should note here that after about 20 minutes at 33 watts, the system itself got pretty buggy. I honestly think that anything above about 30 watts is really going to tax the system too much when it comes to drawing from the battery. So if you do want to push the system like this, I would recommend putting it into docked mode. That way you don't have to worry about the battery drain or any of that bugginess that will come with it. And so overall, I would say considering the fact that we're talking about an x86 handheld, which just is notoriously bad when it comes to battery life, getting an average of about 2 hours and 15 minutes when it comes to that sweet spot of power and performance is actually not bad. And I'm also pretty impressed with that lower power profile. Getting five hours of battery life on this device is pretty good. Okay, and so wrapping things up here, let's talk about what I like and what I don't like about the INEO 2S. We'll start with what I like. Number one is going to be performance. This thing can basically play everything depending on how much juice you want to give it. And I really like the fact that we can play most of those games at a lower power profile than I was expecting. 15 watts is pretty impressive. On top of that, I feel like the entire handheld just has some pretty high quality to it. And so if you are looking for something that's just genuinely impressive when you first pick it up, that's going to be this one here. I also like the fact that they updated the trigger travel length. This is one of those things that really makes the device a lot more fun to play than the previous iteration. And like with the previous device, I also like this display. The colors are very saturated and balanced. But then also I like the high 1200p resolution and then also the 16 by 10 aspect ratio works great when it comes to 4x3 games. Overall, I like the fact that the iNeo 2S is not just a simple spec bump. 
The company really could have just put a new processor inside and called it a day, but instead they used that as an opportunity to tweak some of the issues they had with their previous device. Speaking of issues, let's talk about some of the things I don't like about the iNeo 2S. Number one is the grip. I find that it's just a little bit imperfect. I think when it comes to just picking it up and playing it for a few minutes here and there, it's going to be a really great experience. But I found that playing it for more than an hour just makes my hands want to have a break. Additionally, I feel like the buttons here are just a little bit too small for the size of the device we have. And this is a common issue with many of the other iNeo devices. And honestly, I think these two bullet points are a little bit nitpicky, but all the same, it goes into that third bullet point in the fact that this device has a luxury price tag. And when you're likely going to be paying over $1,000 for a handheld, I think there shouldn't be any compromises at all. And finally, the other thing I wanted to address is just the pace of releases that come from the iNeo company itself. I think the iNeo 2 to the 2S conversion is a great example. Number one, it's only been about seven months from the iNeo 2 to the 2S release right here. And to me, that feels like a breakneck pace. After all, when the first iNeo 2 came out, I said this was the most powerful device on the planet right then. And here we are seven months later and iNeo has already made that other one obsolete. Another good example of why the release pace to me is just a little bit too fast is the fact that there are many things that the iNeo 2S fixes from the iNeo 2. The very fact that the company has an upgrade solution that's free on their website for both the cooling as well as the speakers speaks a lot to me. I think it's an indication that they're just pushing out these devices too fast before they can be properly tested. At the very least, I prefer to have more breathing room between these release cycles, maybe about a year altogether. Not only will it give the company more time to work on the devices and really perfect them, but I bet there's a lot of iNeo 2 owners right now who are feeling like their device is a little bit obsolete and maybe even abandoned. And for me, that's a pretty crummy feeling. After all, the iNeo 2 is a very capable device even today. And so in the end, you may be wondering whether or not I think that the iNeo 2S is going to be worth that significant price point. Now to start, when it comes to price point, that's really going to be up to you. After all, this is a very significant investment. And of course, you can get some devices that may have a similar or a weaker chipset, but for a much lower price. So it's really going to come down to whether or not you think those additional top of the line features are going to be worth shelling out that extra cash. At the very least, I think that if you are in the market to buy a handheld PC, the market itself has never been better. Not only do you have some incredible options at those lower price points, including the Steam Deck and the ROG Ally, if you do want something that is top of the line, then I think the iNeo 2S is going to fill that niche as well. But this recommendation comes with a caveat, and that is that seven months from now, it's very likely that the iNeo 3 or whatever else is coming out next may actually make this one feel a little bit obsolete. And if that does come to pass to you, don't worry about it. After all, the iNeo 2S is a very capable handheld. It really is the kind of device you could take to a deserted island and enjoy for many years to come. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Is the price point justified here with the top of the line features? Or do you prefer the value that can be found within the Steam Deck or the ROG Ally? As always, thank you for watching, and be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.